Okay, Christian, I'm of course familiar with the competitiveness roadmap. Your presentation was based on that. You added a little bit to it, modified it a little bit. So my first question is an easy question. And that is because many people in the audience may not be familiar with the competitiveness roadmap. And uh, the reason the government, broadly speaking, welcomed this because it is always useful to have an external view of what is going on. What has been the reception to the competitiveness roadmap particularly in some of the states, because much of the action mm -hmm. is in the states. So that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, it is useful, even more useful, if you repeat the exercise, because then you can measure the increment as opposed to doing it at one point in time. So is it the plan that this will be repeated in subsequent years? You're saying these were easy questions. I'm not so sure whether they are easy questions for me to answer as an, as an outsider. So if I start with the, with the reception, at least my, my perspective is what, uh, um, th that we are kind of capturing a lot of the ideas and thinking that are already going on in India. Mm -hmm. So we're not kind of going against uh, 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 the flow. And I think, uh, you know, Rick, you, you, you talked particularly about the role of the states and also of the... Uh, uh, the city uh, uh, metropolitan areas. I do think there's a lot of movement in that direction. Um, I hope that the report helps to kind of structure that even more and kind of identifies that these ways of organizing the policy dialogue in India uh, and creating the institutional structures to act upon it, that that's actually a priority. Uh, it's not always urgent, but it is very important. And so I think that uh, I, I got the sense that we've triggered some of the discussions uh, that, that are hopeful in that direction. Um, now, are we already there yet? That's very hard for me to tell from the outside. Uh, you know, I hope that we can uh, also get to very concrete projects, but we can pilot a little bit more what these ideas actually mean. They are somewhat abstract uh, at that level, but I think there is, there is more that hopefully uh, can, uh, can be done. Um, repeating this over time, I think this would be a great idea. I think what we've try to say in our report is that it's actually not very useful in terms of these policies that you've, especially for 25 years, kind of start out with a very rigid agenda and say now for the next years just execute on it. Things get in between. You know, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine came in between. We have a very different situation now. So I think having some sort of uh, uh, um, uh, dialogue that happens every year or two years to kind of go back and say, okay, so what did different ministries do about this? How have they taken this on? What do we need to revise? I think would be a very helpful exercise and uh, uh, kind of providing that type of data infrastructure. Maybe that's a task, you know, I mean, uh, uh, for both of you to take on, you know, with a yearly or bi-yearly uh, 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 kind of rhythm. So I think that's a, that's a good idea to pursue. Okay, so now let me flag something that's not directly in the competitiveness roadmap, which after all is for India at 100, which is 2047. Now India, of course, is a relatively young country, but it's also a country where, and I'm saying this because some people may not know this, the absolute number of people in the under 15 age group has actually declined. I'm not talking about the percentage, the absolute number. The rate of population growth is now down to about 0.8%, which means India may today be relatively young, but India will certainly age pretty fast. Mm. So how would you, I know it's not directly in the, mm. uh, in, the, in the report, how do you react to this prospect of a country that's going to become old before mm. it becomes rich. Mm. Mm. By the time we reach per capita income of 10,000 US dollars using official exchange rates, parts of the country will already be old. We have a state like Kerala, where the percentage of the old population is already, I think, about 12% or so. No, absolutely. And I think what that means is that despite the great future that India has ahead of itself, it has no time to waste. And the challenge is, is that, you know, how do we create in a political system enough urgency 
to kind of see these trends, uh, uh, trends ahead of you. I think that is, that is very difficult. You know, we see it with climate change. We see it with other issues. Um, and I, India needs to think about how can it work these type of issues into your institutional architecture so that there is somebody who worries about this now and kind of can influence what others are doing. That being said, you know, I mean, you're, you're pr absolutely right to point, point out the, the, the trends that India is facing. Comparatively to many other countries, you still have much more of a window to act. You know, I mean, I think we, we know that, obviously, in China, I think the, the aging is much more dramatic, and it's imminent now. Uh, we see in, in, in Europe, where I leave, live, you know, I mean, I think we're already seen by many as a museum that's kind of irrelevant for the future. Um, so I think you have a bit more time, but that doesn't mean that you can't ignore it. I think it's, again, you know, how do you start acting early? And that'll be much easier than for India to kind of be, be prepared to that demographic change. Also, what it means is, and I'm not asking you to react to that, also what it means is that we have planned for a large number of schools, assuming a large number of young population. Now, some of those schools will have to be rationalized and closed down, and it has begun to happen in some of the states. Now, let me move on to something else, which you haven't talked about, and it's difficult for you as an outsider to talk about which is the quality of data. And the reason I'm flagging this is uh, you talked about labor participation rates. The labor participation rates come through surveys, and many of our, much of our data comes through surveys. You take something like female participation in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a gender issue. Of course, there is an issue of getting more people into the workforce, as you've rightly flagged. But I look at something like female work participation rate, there will be a figure of about 30%. Mm -hmm. But that's because the survey does not properly capture particularly casual employment. And the ILO itself said, says that a corrected figure would be of the order of 46%. Or you mentioned inequality, which of course is based on Amit Kapoor's work. But Amit Kapoor's work is based on the World Inequality Report, which actually has data for 2011-12. So every assertion about inequality is actually based on an assertion that's for the period leading up to 2011-12. So as an external observer, in your experience, what have been the systems to use methods other than the old-fashioned mm -hmm. surveys mm -hmm. to capture data real time using modern technology. Yeah. No, I think you're, you're pointing out a, a, a real problem you know, that we see. Partly it's the availability of data, and partly it is the way that the data is collected with a perspective that might mm -hmm. not perfectly fit India. You know, whether it's female uh, workforce participation, I think, you know, for example, one of your colleagues recently argued around the stunting data. You know, yeah. Is that actually telling us the right story about India? And so we urbanization is another one. You know, I think we, we are partly flying blind. I mean, we try to use for the report the best data that's available, but that best data might not be particularly uh, good. Uh, we just heard, uh, Kamal, the discussion about regions. You know, I mean, we use the periodic uh, labor force survey uh, in order to have very granular structural data on sectoral employment by district. But we also looked about the data across years, and sometimes there's huge differences, which makes you a bit worried about the quality of that data. So there is a need to act. I would think that India is actually in a very good position to use its digital infrastructure to address these this type of issue. Because I've seen in other countries, and you know, for example in Vietnam, that they have been able to increase the quality of data quite dramatically over the last 10 years or so. I see very little reason for why India shouldn't be able to do that. Yes, you're a much larger and more complex society and so on, but in some other aspects you have better tools in terms of digitalization to do that. So making that a priority I think is really important because, as the last panel also showed, you will need to make so many choices that are very region and sector specific, and to make those choices right, kind of broad data that 
might only be 80% right is not very helpful. You need to have very concrete data. So I think if, if, if uh, you know, Niti Ayog and, and, and of course you as the advisory council to the prime minister play a very important role, I think, in really pressing for this and trying to, uh, to do more in that direction. Also on the data, and I'm taking you into something that you have not talked about, Nirvikar has actually, that you've done some work also on the states. Mm. So when I look at the states, I have the GSDP data, the gross state domestic product, which is not necessarily the same as gross income. Mm. It's a different matter that I don't get data on income for a state. So Punjab, the GSDP would be low, but Punjab and Kerala, two extreme examples, they are driven by remittance income. So it would not mm. show up in the GSDP. So do you use GSDP or is there some other surrogate indicator that you use when you look at the states? No, we, so, so, so I think we, we've barely scratched the, uh, the surface, I would say, at looking at the states. And, uh, you know, yes, we've seen these, these disparities. We've tried to, again, look at the data that exists. But I would see that as a very important next step to really say, you know, how can we take this framework, also the analytical framework for the diagnostics that we apply to India as a whole, drive that down to individual states and try to get more to closer assessment on what the issues are for specific parts of the country. Okay, now let's move on to employment. Uh, we know that the employment elasticity of growth mm. has declined in India. About two decades ago, it used to be about 0 0.4, it's about 0 0.2 now. And part of the reason, of course, is that manufacturing or perhaps all of growth is no longer as employment intensive mm. as it used mm. to be. So do you have any specific thoughts about what should be done to increase employment? And let me add a follow-up question to that. Enrollment rates in education have gone up. Mm. They've gone up across all the states. So is there an issue of a lack of correlation between education and skills, or skills mm. as mm. valued mm. by the market? Mm. So do you have thoughts on A, employment generation, yeah. and B, skill development? So absolutely, I think on employment generation, I think uh, this was a huge learning for, for myself, because usually in this competitiveness space, we think about productivity, we think about innovation, we think about the, the shining, most sexy part of the economy. Now, what I tried to point out at the beginning of my talk is that at that end, actually, India works quite well, has still more work to do. But the problem is much more what do we in, do in the lower productivity sectors, the entry-level jobs that might actually, on average, reduce your average productivity because you're bringing in people that, that have lower productivity than the average person. I think it's absolutely necessary that India starts to think more dynamically about what are the long-term effects of creating jobs uh, at, the, at the sort of bottom of the pyramid, but jobs that can kind of grow people up. And the, the roadmap tries to point out where might some of these opportunities be, where we actually have lower entry barriers for lower skilled people, and partly also females. So we try to look at those type of sectors. Um, that is a very different framework from what we usually have done in our competitiveness analysis, which, which are very much about raising productivity uh, uh, directly. And it is one, again, that I think many countries face. You know, especially This is the same discussion that we're having in Africa about economic development. How can we shift the mix of sectors that we work with? So much more about healthcare, logistics, even in education. I think you know, agriculture is a very important topic. You talked about the changes within agriculture that are absolutely critical. Textile manufacturing, you know, I mean, I think why, why is, has India followed back there? It might not be as sexy, but it's actually very important to figure out um, um, what can be done. So, so I think there is a huge focus on the employment generation element. Um, we need to, to focus on that rather than the overall GDP. Now on, on education, I think the challenge is, and, and for that the education sector I think is a very good example. India has improved sort of its inputs in an education kind of the en en enrollment rates. Um, but it seems like the output of the education system, and again, data is, kind of not, not, not very robust, but at least doesn't seem to have improved. It seems like the educational outcomes for students kind of has suffered, especially now, of course, through the pandemic, which has been devastating for educational outcomes across the world. So we are faced with a situation that the vast majority of the people that are entering the labor force every year are not the IIT graduates that will work in IT companies where the Americans are investing or the Europeans are investing.
but actually people where Indian employers say, you know, these people are basically unemployable. I need to start from zero. And so I think this is a huge topic, uh, I think, for, for Indian policymakers that will really determine uh, things for years to come because we know from our studies that what happens early on uh, as you enter the labor force has a long-term impact on your potential career path through the entire life, lifetime of your, of your job tenure. In sort of passing, pre-COVID, if an economy is growing at 7% and we do not believe that productivity is growing at 7%, then some employment generation must be taking place. Mm. It perhaps is not the 10 million that one wants, mm. but it cannot be zero million either. Right. It's right. probably going to be about six or seven million. But as a refinement on the exercise that you have done is, and this came up in the last panel also, that labor is in the concurrent list. And as Kunal said, the 37 central codes have now been unified into four, but the orders are left to the states. And as the last panel also remarked, or I think Dilvikar said it, is that there are the Shops and Establishments Act, which mm. are completely state-specific. And therefore, states have varied in the degree to which they have imparted flexibility in the labor laws, which does not mean something as simple as the Industrial Disputes mm. Act. It is more the orders, the regulations, etc. Now, one of the interesting things, and because Nirvikar mentioned this, one of the interest mentioned economic survey, the last economic survey, one of the interesting things in the last economic survey is the size of the average firm has been increasing for the mm. first time in a long, long time. So in future exercises, do you have any plans to refine the labor part of it further and look at the way states have been doing various things? I think that would be great to, to, to do so. One particular aspect uh, related to what you just said that we recommend in the report is really to look at what's, what's happening to firm size and productivity and what can we do in India in order to enable more growth of kind of small, medium-sized companies. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, you know, the, the data that exists is very dated, but it seems to suggest that Indian companies get very old, but they don't grow, they don't get better. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's the dynamism that, especially here in the Bay Area, but also in more advanced economies in general, comes from companies that grow or that disappear from the market. And we need better data. We need to understand what are the critical drivers. I'm convinced that the labor regulation is one critical piece to it. There might be capital to ac uh, access to capital issues as well. There might be access to skills uh, uh, issues. There might be access to market, which has more to do with infrastructure, partly also trade rules. But I think that's a very important topic to take on in future work, yes. Well, traditionally, Indian companies have not exactly disappeared. And I want to quickly mention, for those who do not know, the insolvency and bankruptcy code which has been very important because it's the first time promoters have been forced to exit. But let me quickly draw you in now on the clusters because mm. you worked also on the clusters. So tell us a little bit about the clusters because throughout the world, growth has been driven by specific clusters, right. as so right. in India. So right. what right. is... What is your sense of what's going on? So, so absolutely. That? And, you know, as you said, I think this is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I think it is an idea that, uh, as a way to understand the economy, has become maybe even more relevant now. Because we are becoming more knowledge-driven. And as, as was pointed out in the last panel, this is enormously concentrated also in India and many countries and others as well. The economic activity is kind of in a specific places where we have co-location of skills, co-location of related activities, and so on. Uh, so it's just as a way to understand the modern economy, one has to realize that firms do not operate in isolation. It's not the star CEO alone or the technology there, but it operates in an ecosystem, and at least part of that is kind of geographically anchored in a specific region uh, and so on. We've seen that very clearly for India as well, and you know, I think particularly when we looked at district-level data and looked at specialization, you could see levels of concentration of specific sectors that are very high. A few locations dominating India's output uh, uh, in specific industries. And you see that the nature of regions is quite different by their composition of these type of clusters. Again, these 10% of districts that, that were mentioned on our map. These, these are primarily manufacturing clusters. Well, it's manufacturing, but it's also business services, it's logistics, okay. Okay. it's finance. 
covers the entire, uh, entire economy. These strongest regions kind of are more in advanced cluster categories, but they also have a broader portfolio of activities that's kind of uh, uh, strengthening uh, uh, one another. Now, for policymakers, you know, uh, the, 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 the naive response to that observation for many years was, let's create clusters. So if it's so good to have these clusters, we want also some of them. I think what we've learned is that that quite often doesn't work that easily, because this is an ecosystem, this grows. However, what you can do, and I think that's what we're suggesting in the roadmap, is to recognize that you can take a cluster perspective to your economic policy. So a better integration of, for example, FDI attraction, business regulation, infrastructure investment, skill upgrading, from the perspective of a specific cluster category, a set of industries that are located in a region. And that's what's often missing, not only in India. We have kind of isolated efforts that try to do all of these things, but they are not really targeted and they are not really integrated. So that's where I would see the future for, for, for a cluster approach in India. It's not just about a network of very small artists, artists and companies. That's also fine, but that's not changing the dial on, on a national level. But it's about using it as an instrument to better integrate and coordinate policy making uh, and, and really recognize that it's about different locations within the country that will kind of compete and build their specialization pattern. And of course, uh, the PLI has been mentioned. Yeah. Phase manufacturing program and PLI are now beginning to result in a different kind of cluster completely, <clears throat> with India becoming part of the global supply chain. Mm. But Amit, what are the rules? Is Christian allowed to take questions from the floor? And how much time? We have five minutes. We have five minutes. Now, by the way, the report is there on the website. Yeah. So I would recommend on various websites actually. So I would recommend that people read the report. Yes, Kunal, I saw Kunal's hand. You can raise your voice. Yeah, so, uh, so I always have this uh, predicament between talking about clusters and talking about diversification. So it always seems to me that clusters is like highly focused, localized economies in a particular region. Uh, whereas uh, what most of the research that I come across in organizations specifically talk about, the greater diversification you have, you move from one to another, improve your complexity over time, that leads to better economic yeah. progress. So I see a, uh, I, uh, dichotomy I'm not able to make sense of, right. which is what right. I, my question is right. to you. Yeah. I, I, absolutely, and I, I think it's, uh, you, you're not alone in, in, in kind of you know, uh, trying to get your hand around that. I think it's a completely false dichotomy. I think what we're seeing is that more advanced locations also in India are able su to support a broader portfolio of strong clusters. It doesn't mean that they're not specialized at all. But instead of a, a, a weak location, which is maybe strong in one or two areas, an advanced region can support four, five, six areas. But within these, it actually has these groups of related and collaborating industries and sectors. So it is not at all a dichotomy. I think it's really kind of understanding uh, advanced economies means understanding kind of that they become a portfolio of strength in specific areas. It's not that they have abandoned strength and kind of are average on everything. Uh, and, and I think that's a very important kind of idea to, to, to get through. Yes, the gentleman there. Yes. Uh, I'm Prakash Abalka. Um, my question um, is, are we barking up the wrong tree? And let me explain. Um, it, traditionally, it has been emphasized that the lower categories economically of people need employment in manufacturing. And that is supposed to be the one thing they can do very well. Um, I've long argued that the urbanization and the globalization has created opportunities for services vastly at a faster rate than manufacturing. And it's not because of lethargy in manufacturing. It has to do with the change in the character of employment. And the best example of that, um, other than the fact that in cities, uh, gig work and uh, business process automation and so on have all created more jobs than have been lost through the movement of manufacturing. The best example is the recent example in the US, where we were so concerned about uh, jobs. And the greatest impact on jobs and the, the unemployment and employment generation numbers have been in services. And it is, you might say, well, that is because it's a developed economy. And I would say, no, it is because the nature of business, nature of employment, and the nature of production has changed. So 
uh, my question, therefore, is are we barking up the wrong tree when we keep emphasizing that the real way to create jobs is in manufacturing? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think this was one of the key issues that we also discussed within the course of, of our project. And I fully agree with you. I think we need to get away from our obsession with manufacturing alone. I do think there are opportunities in manufacturing. And I mean, you know, we heard about Apple and, and telecommunication. I think renewable energy equipment, I think, is another area where good jobs can be created. But if you look at our report, you'll find that a lot of it is actually about services. It is about looking at those type of opportunities Partly also because one of the critical things that made manufacturing so attractive in the past is no longer true. And that is that it was the entry level for low-skilled people. I mean, if you now go into a manufacturing plant, a modern manufacturing plant, the skill levels are actually quite high. You know, you can't just go in there without any degree or experience. And so I think we need to re rethink that. And our argument was not to abandon manufacturing now, but you have to look at a broader portfolio of activities, including services, in order to create the job opportunities that India needs. Can you carry this conversation on offline? <laughs> last question, I think I saw another hand. Yes, please. Two last questions here and then here. Uh, my name is Walter Mark from a Slack National Lab up on the hill. I just want to make one comment. The education system in India or British Crown Colony before always focused on the elite education. I believe the quality of the worker would drive the economy. So I would suggest that pay a lot more Pay a lot more in the education system reform so that you have more qualified engineers and workers so you can drive the economy up the tier. Okay, that was more like a comment, so mm -hmm. perhaps you can react to both. This is the last question from here. Yeah, uh, when the state grows, nation grows, but uh, in our report and uh, in last presentation also, we have seen that nobody or we are not talking about the decentralization of. Uh, power, especially when city grows, the economy grows. So what is your comment on, and especially in this report at India at uh, 100? Yeah, so if I understand the, the question. Decentralization of power to the municipalities. Yeah, so, so I, I rather talk about you know, what's the right interplay between the different roles and responsibilities. It's not just about pushing responsibilities or even or financing as well down. Uh, which to some degree has happened. But I think it's about thinking through what do we need to do at the national level, what can we do at the state level, and what can we do at metropolitan levels. And it's the interplay. And, and again, you know, I mean, I think as, as, as uh, Rick pointed out, you know, I mean, Niti Ayog has been absolutely critical, I think, in this mind change to say how can we support states and metropolitan areas in making the best policies that they can make. We are not making them for them. We are trying to help them. Uh, uh, to, to do this better, and I think that's something that you know I would that I would argue doubling down on, uh, you know, and doing much more more of. I think that's what India needs. And uh, as both Rick and Nirvikar, I think, said that uh, there are issues which has nothing to do with Christian's report directly. There are issues about municipal finances and the state finance commissions. We've run out of time, so will you please join me in thanking Christian? And when you read the report, supplement supplement the report, reading the report, with what Christian has said here. Christian, thank, thank you. you very thank much. You.